Hello and welcome. This is Matthias 76, and together we are decoding the deception. Together, today, we're starting out a new study, a new study in the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews. We're here on our Bible blog homepage, and you can go down and find all the different series that we have done, Revelation, Matthew, Psalms, Exodus, Joshua, Daniel, First and Second Thessalonians. We've got all those studies out there for you, and we will be adding, it'll be right up here at the top, Hebrews. Let's jump in. So here we are. We are at the beginning of the letter to the Hebrews. Just a little bit of introductory material because I'll just make the note. I don't like to do a lot of introductory material as we start a book because it's boring for the most part. <laughs> I'll give a highlights and then we will touch on things that are key, that are characteristic to help us understand this book as we move along. Just some introductory material. This is the letter to the Hebrews. Nowhere in the book does it ascribe to itself that title. It doesn't have a title like that. We don't know. We know it's written to Hebrews, and, and we can tell that by the content. The content of the book is crafted for those who are conversant in the Old Testament, who know the scriptures, who know the Torah, the law, the prophets well. It's, it's obviously written to a Jewish audience. Which Jews? Where? We don't know. We don't know. Now, as to who wrote the book. If you go open up your King James version of the Bible, it will say Paul's letter to the Hebrews. A lot of people for a long time assumed it was the Apostle Paul. We don't know who wrote the letter to the Hebrews, but pretty certain it's not Paul. You cannot read the Greek and, and that's where you really have to go to get a feel for the style, the vocabulary, the syntactical structure, all of that, the, the illustrations, the, the motifs that are used there. When you go look at this Greek and you compare it to Paul's Greek, they are as different as night is from day. And, and I'm not putting Paul's Greek down. <clears throat> but ju just for example, as, as young people study Greek, biblical Greek, and are hoping to become pastors and teachers, etc., the their Greek professor will give them a slug from the book of Hebrews to translate just to humble them, okay? The first two words in Greek in the letter to the Hebrews, these two words right here, polymeros e polytropos, only occur here in the entire Greek New Testament. There are in the first four verses, I believe, five or six words that only appear right here in the entire Greek New Testament, okay? This is not the vocabulary of the Apostle Paul. This is written much more along the lines of elevated, lofty Greek like Philo, who was a Jewish philosopher in Alexandria. It, it follows rules and things for balance and symmetry and flow and rhythm that is unlike anything else in the Greek New Testament. Okay, enough on that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time geeking out on the Greek. At least I'll try not to. But it, it's important to understand. A good candidate for who this might be that, that people go to often is Apollos. Apollos, who we are told by Luke in the book of Acts, was eloquent. Eloquent. He was well-spoken. He was from Alexandria, which is where Philo was from. Good candidate 
for this is Apollos. Bottom line, it doesn't matter who wrote the book. Might it be nice to know? Yeah, the Holy Spirit didn't see fit for us to have that information. What we do know is that the letter to the Hebrews, as it is titled, is an important piece of biblical literature. It teaches us all kinds of things that are presented in a unique way, images, pictures, that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow, discerning the attitudes and intentions of the heart. Even in English, that's, that just flows. It's, it's eloquent. There's balance and symmetry to it as you read it. But the content is what is what really matters. As far as a theme, I think it's important to, to, when possible, discern a theme to the book. And, and the book, you know, just as Philippians is the epistle of joy, forms of the word joy, the Greek word for joy, appear countless times, not countless, but multiple, multiple, multiple times in the book of Philippians, okay? Hebrews has a theme. And, and to put it in an ineloquent way, and I have never claimed eloquence as one of my gifts or rhetorical abilities as one of my gifts, Jesus is better. That's the theme for, for us Americans, people in the modern world, whose even our English skills and abilities continue to degrade, it would seem, we'll just go with Jesus is better. Now, the author to the Hebrews, he, he would have said, oh, come on, you can do better than that. How about the supremacy of Jesus? Because there are all of these different vignettes that are given of Jesus is better. He's superior to angels. He's superior to the Aaronic priesthood, and that's Aaron, Aaronic priesthood. He's superior to all of these different things. Where, wherever you want to go, Jesus is superior. He's better. He's above and beyond everything and everyone else. Enough for introductory stuff. We will come back and, and visit all of those thoughts as we move along as is appropriate for discerning and understanding the text. And I do encourage you, go through and listen, get on your version app and listen to the entirety of the book of Hebrews. There is a, an advantage to hearing it all at once. You see the flow of things and get a feel for the book in a, in a deeper and more meaningful way. The other thing is, I like to say that Hebrews is the book that there are sections of it everyone is familiar with. What I just said about the Word of God being living and active. You know, the, the heroes of faith in chapter 12. The things it says in chapter 6 and chapter 10 about falling away from the faith and the dangers of that. But as I, I think it accurate to say that as modern-day believers, we are not as well familiar with the book of Hebrews in its entirety as we are other epistles in the New Testament. And again, epistle is just that word for letter. These are This is a letter written to a group of Jews somewhere, somewhere. And, and, and I will go so far as to say that it likely that it was written to a group of Jews who were part of a congregation that was Jews and Gentiles, but the letter focused in on the Jews and challenges and struggles that they were having living their faith. One more thing I forgot to say as far as introductory material. See, I say I'm not going to say a lot about something, and then I end up saying more. It's just the way I operate, the rattled way in which my brain files through information. Date for the book. That is that is important. It is likely early 60s is when 60s, 80, 
early 60s is when this book was written. A bunch of reasons for that that I won't go through. But the one key thing is, if the temple had come down 70 AD, Titus, if Jerusalem was surrounded by the Romans and that was going on, this author almost certainly, given the content of this book, would have referenced that. And there is none of that. So early 60s is the best time frame for where this letter probably falls. I want to pause for just a moment and jump in here and ask you, give us a thumbs up. It lets other people know this video is worth their time. We'll jump in. We'll read the first four verses. That is what we are going to cover today. Long ago, and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. I've never read four verses before and thought, man, I'm going to have a hard time getting through this in, in 45 minutes. But he starts off with this, this elegant expression, long ago, at many times, and in many ways. Now, just as to the, the, the Greek style here, if you look at that word, and I'm not, I'm not going to read it to you, but this is the letter pi, our P. Look, pi, 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 pi. Five times, alliteration. It, it, it is as though this is the text from the speech from a, a gifted orator, okay? But long ago, long ago, talking about back through the ages, he, he's with just one verse, he's calling to mind all of the action of God communicating to the fathers, and that is exactly the way a Jew would think of the patriarchs, which means fathers. As we record this, it is Father's Day, this Sunday that we are recording this. But think of, I, I, I love this expression, at many times and in many ways. At many times and in many ways. And you know, again, in this modern day, modern day Christendom has, for the most part, not become as familiar, stayed as familiar and conversant with the Old Testament text as we should. We're not as familiar with it as we should. And I'm, I'm putting myself into that basket. That's me. And I'm working hard to correct that. For decades, I had neglected the Old Testament, but it is key to fully understanding and comprehending the gospel as it has been bestowed upon us in this latter day, because the gospel is the fulfillment of all the promises and workings of God in the Old Testament. And if that is the case, then I, as a believer in the gospel era, need to be as familiar as possible, as well-read as possible with the Old Testament that is all that which was the precursor to the New Testament. And, and with that, we can we can think about we can think about how God's gospel promise, is woven through the history, if you think of the, the all of the Old Testament, the history of God's people as a tapestry that the gospel promise 
and the further expansion and information about that promise is the golden thread that is woven so beautifully throughout that tapestry. But the tapestry itself is about God's relationship with his children, his nation, the people that he formed for himself when he called Abram from Ur of the Chaldeans, that that guy who was nothing. He set all the other nations aside, and he called Abram. And through Abram, he created a great nation. He gave it birth through the Exodus and then they truly became a nation and they came and had the land that had been promised to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob. They had just been sojourners there. But then as that narrative goes on, there's all the times that, and, and it it is what the Old Testament in large part is about, the children of Israel continue to fall away and sin and go after other gods. And God continues to work to bring them back. And in his zeal, his dedication and fervor in doing that is amazing. His love for them and his desire to save them in spite of themselves is what is all pulled together. All that stuff that I just rattled off about, went on about, The people to whom this letter was addressed didn't need to hear any of that. It was the the substance of their reality. It was who they were. And, And they, much more than we today, we think of ourselves as I'm a standalone item. Today, as I record this, my father's out in the other room. He's he's visiting with us. And what what we fail to appreciate is that I am because he was. I am who I am in large part because I stand on his shoulders as he stands on his father's shoulders and mother's shoulders and on back and back and back through time. The people to whom this letter was addressed understood that they were part of all that. They didn't think of themselves as standalone, I'm independent. Nonsense. I'm nothing without the people who came before me, who shaped me, who influenced me, who helped to make me who I am. So all of this stuff that I just went on about, the the narrative of the Old Testament and the stories and and how, how God again and again, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Think of all the different ways. God sent his prophets, that he called his prophets, that he spoke through the prophets, whether it was Moses or Elijah or Isaiah or David or Samuel. Think of all the different modes of communication that God used, the mode of communication of giving the prophet a dream in a vision taking Isaiah up so that he beheld in Isaiah 6 the throne room of God and was called and said, here am I, send me, send me. All of those different pictures, all of those different ways God communicated. And and what an amazing thing it is that God loves his children, and that includes us here today. He loves us enough to communicate with us in all these different ways, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And if you're a parent, here we are on Father's Day, if you're a parent and a parent of multiple children, and and, and we all fall short, we all, none of us are the parents that we should be. But as, as we learn and as we get better, we realize I need to operate with this child differently than with that child. Because they're different. You you know, with this one, I've got to bang on pots and jump up and down to get their attention. With the other one, if I just look at them and raise my eyebrows, they're crushed, right? I, I have to shape the message to deal with them so that it communicates with them. And that's what God has done. He went every effort, every conceivable way, he communicated 
with his children so that he might save them. That was his heart's desire. Come, let us reason together. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. That was his desire. All this I've done for you. Why do you go chasing off after these other gods who cannot save? So it long ago, and it's almost like a Star Wars, long ago in a galaxy far away, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. That and, and that whenever they heard the term fathers, that was their heritage. That was their lineage. That was their identity. So it, it was a very positive thing. This was an amazing, they were the chosen children of God, his nation formed by him, made out of nothing, an old man who was too old to have kids and a woman who was too old to have kids. And he made them into a great nation like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. But but in contradistinction to all that, and and there are things here in Hebrews because the, the Greek is so lofty and elevated that if it was translated so that it carried all of the the, the nuance of what's said in the Greek, it would be verbose and long and clunky. But in the Greek, it's very elegant. But but this is complete contrast. The way the structure of the, the grammar is used here, completely more than all of that. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So not belittling all the stuff that God had done before, but basically, you know, when you look at the Old Testament and God's working there, and then what we see in Jesus Christ and the work of salvation and who he is that he came and did all of this, it is here, the the, the structure of the language is saying, but but you ain't seen nothing yet. This this is way above and beyond as great as all that was. And it was, this is more. But in these last days, that is a Septuagint phrase. And the and the Septuagint, it's right here. You see, look up here at the top. See LXX, that's for 70 Latin numbers. The, the Septuagint is the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek. Why? Because Alexander the Great came through and conquered everything. And one of the things he did that God used, that wild, brilliant, successful, drunken pervert of a general to do was to force the entire known world to learn Greek. They had to learn Greek. And that is why the whole New Testament is written in Greek, because everyone spoke it. Didn't matter if they were in Galatia, Spain, North Africa, or Babylon. At the time, everyone could read Greek. Okay? And the, they translated the Bible into Greek, the Old Testament into Greek, and that is the Septuagint. It's a very important document that we have, and, and there it is. That's Isaiah 60 in, in the Greek, and the author to Hebrews here quotes exclusively from the Septuagint. The phrasing and things can be a little different than it is in the Hebrew because, man, they are two different languages altogether, and he uses the Septuagint, and this phrase, in these last days, the, the, the Greek there, it's in the Septuagint all the time, and, and the way it's used there will give you an example. Um, let's see. This is Numbers 24, 14, and now behold, I am going to my people. This is Moses getting ready to die. Come, I will let you know what this people will do to your people in the latter days. 
okay? Latter days in these last days. It is the same Greek expression, and there are multiple places that this is used. So when are the last days? The last days, you're in them. You're in them, and not just because the wacky, crazy stuff with them destroying our food chain and and making energy ridiculously expensive and getting ready to pull off the Great Reset. Not because of all that. We have been in the latter days, in the last days, ever since Jesus ascended into heaven. What else is to come? He's going to come back and judge. The same Jesus, Acts 11, whom you've seen taken into heaven, will so come in like manner from heaven. It's the only thing yet to happen. So rightly understood from the time Jesus ascended 50 days after his resurrection until he comes back, those are the latter days. Now, do things get worse and worse and worse as as we progress along? It certainly seems so. And, And the scriptures, the book of Revelation, Matthew 24 and Mark 13 definitely bear that out. But the latter days began with Jesus' ministry and the fulfillment of his ministry. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. His son, the the one who was sent, the full manifestation of who the Father is. And and this is the, the, the way it's stated here in the Greek, and I'm trying not to geek out on the Greek, but it's really hard with Hebrews. It is the essence of what a son is. The, the, the grammatical way it's put in here, his son, he spoke to us by his son. How dear that son is to him. All that a son is and the, the father's hope for that son. That's, that's the idea. In, in the way this term, the title is used here, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Who is Jesus? He's got it all. He's got it all in his hand. He's got it all under his control. It is all his. It was all made through him. He rules all things. The father has placed it under his feet. God made his enemies a footstool. For his feet. Psalm 110, he has been appointed, put in place, assigned the heir of all things. There is this relationship between the Father and the Son that they are, you know, the the, the Trinity blows our minds if you try to really get into it and understand it and comprehend it. But they're both God. The, the, the Holy Spirit is God. They're all essence of God. They're all this, but the, the persons of the Trinity operate amongst themselves in a, in a different way. And it's hard for us to fathom. But it's all, it all belongs to all of them, but there is a hierarchy in how they operate. And the Father has appointed the Son the heir of all things. And it's interesting. We've just finished up, and not all of them are out there yet. I'm working on editing them, our our study in Matthew. But in Matthew 21, with the the parable of the the vineyard, what is it that the, the, the keepers of the vineyard said when they saw the sun coming? But when the tenants saw the sun, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Same word. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. In spite of what they intended, in spite of what they thought, God has placed him, appointed him, made him heir of all things. All of these things bespeak Christ's magnificence, his glory, his power, his control. All of that is what the author is going to be laying out here, heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. We're just going to look at each one of these individually. He created the world through the Son, and that's not a unique thought here. John 1.3, John's prologue, that beautiful flowing introduction to the gospel of John, all things were made through him, 
and without him was not anything made that was made. He created, what did he create? What did he create? Now, it's interesting. Here, and, and I'm not picking on the, on the translation. Here, we're using the ESV. I use the ESV because, well, you got to use something. And I got tired of changing translations. The ESV is fine. In most instances, the ESV is fine. For those out there, especially in my international audience who are multilingual, bilingual, you know there are things that just don't go directly from one language into another. And oftentimes, we're dealing with things that came from Hebrew, went to Greek, and now we're talking about them in English, and they spent a good bit of time in Latin before that. But this phrase, the world, tus ionas, what it really means is everything that exists anywhere. Everything that exists anywhere. What did he create? He created everything that exists anywhere. Now, we call that the world. You can call it the universe. We're going to deal with that translation here in a minute where it says universe. Anything that's been created anywhere, everything that exists anywhere is what he created. Without him, there is not. Nothing. Nothing. He that goes on, and, and all of these things that follow here, the he is the radiance, the exact imprint, upholds, all of those things. The, the way it's structured is saying, even though he's this, and even though he's this, even though he's that, that he made purification for sins. This incomprehensible, immeasurable, infinite, glorious, majestic being through whom everything was made. He's the one who made purification for sins. That's a mind bender, but that's what the author is setting forth here. So he created everything that exists anywhere. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Radiance. When was the last time you used the word radiance? Or radiant? Glowing, shining. You can't miss it. Maybe you used it, you know, when, when, when a bride is ready for her wedding day. And she's all made up in that beautiful dress and, and all ready and all prepared. You might say she just looked radiant as she came down the aisle, just glowing, right? Radiant, radiant. Jesus is, he is the radiance of the glory of God. What we see shine through him is the very glory of God. John 1, 9, again, from the prologue, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Same gospel, John of John, Jesus says of himself, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The light of life shines because Jesus is the radiant glory of God. First John 1 5. And this is a theme in the Gospel of John and then in John's epistles. He has themes that he uses. And then light and darkness, light and darkness. And in 1 John, he just fully expands on it. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That sounds very radiant. Doesn't, doesn't it? And then verse seven, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we walk in his radiance. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus, who says, I am the light of the world, says, you are the light of the world. Why? Because Christ is formed in us. He is being 
in an ongoing way formed in us. He's being formed in you as you hear and study and, and, and gather around this word here today, wherever you might be. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This theme, this concept of radiance of the glory of God, it flows from him and we reflect it. And because he's formed in it, in us, it shines out from us. So he is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. Man, we get into some, some really deep stuff. The word imprint is character. Now, right there it is in Greek. Character. 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 Imprint. The, the image was used of how they would make a coin. They take a piece of gold, put it in a mold that had a imprint on one side, hold a thing over it that had an imprint there and whack it with a hammer. What you got was the exact imprint, the representation of what was on that mold. It's now on the coin. Well, he is the exact imprint of his nature. And, and that word for nature, it's, it's hypostasis, but it is it is if, if you strip away all the stuff that you see on the outside, what's at the core? What's really there? Who is that person? Who is that deity? He is the exact imprint of his nature. What you got in Jesus, Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When Thomas said, show us the Father, that was the night before the night that Jesus was portrayed. He said, if you've, if you've seen the, me, you've seen the Father. He is the exact imprint of his nature. If you want to know God, look at Jesus. You want to know God's heart toward you? Look at Jesus, the one who went the way of the cross and suffered and died to save you. You want to see the Father's heart toward you, his patience? Think of Jesus saying to the disciples, oh, you of little faith. He didn't blow them up. He didn't yell at them and scold them. He was compassionate and understanding. He knew their weakness and their shortcomings and he loved them anyway. And never forget, God doesn't just love you. He likes you. Think about that. God likes you. It's really, really cool. You look at yourself and you see just a, a, a bucket of shortcomings. He doesn't. He doesn't. He sees you as his dear child. And on Father's Day, Mother's Day, we, we, we can think of that. You know, what do you think when you see your kids? I see all the good stuff, right? And I'm so proud of them and who they are, what they've become. I, I, don't, I only see the good stuff. And that's the way the Father is. And that's the way Jesus is, who is the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The universe. It literally says all things, all things, and it's regularly translated universe. Again, I'm not beating up the Bible translation. He upholds all things. What is included, and, and this is why I think it important, what is included in all things that's not in the universe? Well, I, I think we could say the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is the spiritual realm, that place that we are not, but the angels are, and the sons of God, those B'nai Elohim, are, and that fabric of that reality, which we cannot begin to comprehend, is that part of all things? I think so. Because what's not part of all things? Well, nothing. Everything's part of all things. He upholds all things, all things, the spiritual realm as well. And that has significance in all kinds of ways. In what reality does Satan exist? Well, he exists in the spiritual realm. Is that part of all things? Yes. Therefore, in the end, does he answer to the one who upholds all things by the word of his power? That's why there is no battle at the very end. The battle is now. I just did a video called The Great Tribulation. 
is now. And, and it is. But there is no battle at the end. Because how can you battle? How can Satan and all those he calls together at a place called Armageddon, Revelation 16, how can he battle against the one in whose reality he exists, that reality, the nature of that reality, is held together by your opponent? Yeah, there's not going to be a battle. It's just over and poof, thrown into the lake of fire. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Again, back to the prologue. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Word in Greek is everything. The, the, the core of everything is the word, logos. That's the way the word came to be understood. And here it is, the logos, the word of his power. God's word has power. How did he create everything? He spoke. How does he rule everything? Through his word. And his word, unlike my word, I can speak, and a lot of times nothing happens. I call my dog. Maybe the dog comes. Maybe the dog doesn't. His word has power, and it accomplishes that for which it is sent. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. He and, and that he upholds it, he, he bears it up, he carries it. Without him, it all falls apart, it all falls to the ground. All of these things, the one who is all of these things that he created, he's the radiance, he's the imprint of the nature of God, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. It is this one who, after making purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The theme of the temple, the cult of ritual there, sacrifice, all that it signifies, all that it was about, is going to be dealt with in a very meaningful way in this letter to the Hebrews because it was the fabric of their worship lives. But it all pointed ahead. It was all about the one who would really, truly, fully, and once and for all make purification for sins. Because all the blood of beasts on that altar slain couldn't forgive anyone's sins. It simply pointed ahead to the one who would, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And who was that Lamb of God? He was all these amazing things. The air, the creator, the radiance, the imprint of his nature, and the word of his power. He, he made purification for sin. Sometimes it's a good idea. It's a helpful thing spiritually to spend some time thinking about who your God is, who your Savior is, who it is who, when you stand there in your mind's eye and look up at the cross and see him suffering, bleeding, and dying, who that was. And, and I don't think it is summarized better anywhere than here in these first verses of the book of Hebrews. Do you think that that Savior who sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high is superior? Do you think he's more superior than anything that could take place in a representation in this world of the temple and the tabernacle? Yeah, he's superior. He's everything, and he's your Savior. When you're down, when you feel like you're struggling, and we do because we're weak, because we are but dust, when, when you feel that way, go through and just read these four verses. And stop and think about what each one of these things means. And remember that that Savior, that one, loved you so much, the one who is all of these things, loved you so much that he made purification for sins. God isn't mad at you anymore because of your sin, because Jesus took it. He made purification. It's washed away. Your sins that were as scarlet are now white as Snow. And having done that, 
What did he do? He sat down. He sat down. There's there's all kinds of things that are represented by, by sitting down. But when you sit down, after you've taken on this massive task and, and you achieve it, then what do you do? Poof, you sit down. You sit down. I put in a good day's work. You know, I, I think back to when I was young and doing physical labor, whatever it might be, construction on the farm, whatever, put in a good day's work and you come home. And what do you do? You sit down. It's done. It's accomplished. Because if it weren't done, you'd be back out there continuing to labor away at it. Sitting down, just that act of resting is it signifies that it's done. It's completed. He sat down. And where did he sit down? He sat down at the right hand. What's the right hand? The right hand is the position of power, the right hand man, the right hand man of the king, the right hand man of who? The majesty on high. Here, God, the, the, the Shekinah, the, the glory of God, the radiant presence of God that would come down on the tent of meeting that was there on, on Mount Sinai, all of that, the way Jesus was transformed on the Mount of, of Transfiguration, the majesty on high. It is the majesty is God personified. It's just used here, ascribed to him as a title. And it blows my mind. It blows my mind to think that we will see it. We will see it gathered around the throne with the 24 elders who never stay in those chairs. They're always falling down and praising God and the four living creatures and all the heavenly host and all of the redeemed who have been called out of this earth, redeemed, restored, forgiven, we are going to see the majesty on high. I can't, I can't imagine whatever travails and struggles we go through in this brief little thing that is life, as Paul says in, in Romans 8, far more eloquently than I'm trying to say, nothing here can compare with what it is that is in store for us when we get to be there and see in person and rejoice and sing that new song that only the redeemed can know and sing around the throne of the majesty on high. And there will be our Savior who will have looked at us, separated the sheep from the goats and said, there with me. Amazing, amazing thing. Having said all of that in so few words, the author uses. Having said all of that, and, and talking about the few words again, again, he's talking their language. We have to work and struggle and study and, and get our minds out of, okay, I, I'm this guy in modern America talking to people in the modern world here, and we think this way, and I've got to shift my thinking and transfer it over as best I can to their worldview, how they saw things, how they perceive things. With all this stuff that I just went through and explained, they got it. These are all pictures and references directly to the Old Testament, which was their lives and their culture and their reality. So after having made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than others. Having become, and there's that word, superior. Jesus is better. Jesus is superior. Now, what we might ask if you're going through this and really knocking yourself out and, and taking it apart word for word and phrase by phrase and thinking it through, and you get to this and you might ask yourself, angels, angels, where did angels come from? What, what are angels doing here? Why does he switch to he's superior to angels? And because we do that, it is just a clear indicator that their world, what they knew, how they saw things, isn't your world. 
It isn't their your world. Their world, the, the, the term angels is much superior to angels. That's the next logical step. Why? Because that covenant, that covenant given to Moses was mediated through what? Angels, representatives that God would send. The angels would be used for that. So again, their worldview and how they viewed things, this it, it fits right in. All that stuff he talked about in verse 1, they understood that. And I'll read that again. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Well, angels were integral in all of that. They were right there as part of it. Think of the angel of the Lord. Think of the different times angels came and appeared. But that's just the way they understood things. Okay? We don't because... We've taken angels and put them in a little box with wings and a harp and don't really think much about them. That wasn't the way they saw things. Having become as much superior to angels, how all that stuff happened as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. That name that he has inherited so listen to Ephesians 121, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. He gets a special name. He gets a special name that no one knows unless you're his, that no one gets to hear and see unless you're his is, is the idea because He's, he's something different altogether. He's something different altogether. Philippians 2.9, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And, and we do not yet know what that name is. It's tied up with all that he is and, and, and all the he is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the victorious one. And everyone, because he is superior, everyone will bow the knee and everyone will praise him. Fascinating stuff. Next we're going to stop here. Next, we go into angels, talking a good bit about angels. And do go listen to the book of Hebrews. Listen to it all the way through at least once because you get things out of it. It starts to pull things together and you see the flow of things. But that will help you be well prepared for the study that is to come. Thank you for watching. I hope that you have found this study to be a blessing. And if it is, then go down below, give us a thumbs up, smash that like button. And also while you're down there, if you have not yet, go ahead and subscribe. And when you subscribe, be sure to hit that notification bell, and then you'll be made aware when we put out new content. Share this video with someone else, click on the button, and send it off onto your social media feed. And finally, do drop by and pay us a visit right here at our resource center, decodingthedeception.com. This is Matthias 76, and together we are Decoding the Deception. God bless, and have a great day. Thank you.